So, okay, last week I talked a little bit about um, how neurons can interact and how that changes over time with different plasticity events. So we talked uh, about LTP, LTD, some of the mechanisms, and then we stopped here on, on some mechanism for local uh, um, signaling of maintaining or, or uh, increasing or decreasing synaptic strength, which uh, is an, has an impact basically on the W value, right? So there can be a lot of those. Uh, um, and, and one of the message was that there's different time, uh, time scale that needs to be taken into account. And all of these different time scale interact. And then you can have a lot of um, different results at the level of spines, which are the basically location where you have interaction between neurons, right? So um, LTP here uh, in A, for example, on this specific spine is going to cause some modification in that case, uh, an increase in strength. and which is associated with an increase in some specific proteins that, that, that makes that spine, okay? So you can have very specific input specific uh, uh, increase in strength, right? But then you can also see um, very specific decrease in strength. So in the W value of, of uh, neurons, right? And like last time, just like, don't hesitate to ask question or interrupt or anything, right? Um, the thing is, you, you can have very, very specific modification in some contexts, but in other contexts, um, those modification can be a, a bit more broad. And for example, a single LTD event here will result in the shrinkage of a couple of spines or the complete uh, uh, pruning uh, removal of those spines. Right? And then you have different combination of more local or a, a bit less local plasticity events based on the molecular um, um, events that occur due to synaptic or neuronal activity. Okay. Any questions? Uh, I'm trying to, st to stay high level and not go too much into details because all of that can be pretty confusing. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll throw out something. I read a paper yep. once. I read a paper, and yep. I cannot find this paper, so I apologize. I can't point you to it. But mm -hmm. someone did an analysis of spines, mm -hmm. and um, and their conclusion was that spine growth had less to do with the strength of the synapse and more to do with the permanence of the synapse. That is, both. I would say both. Okay, but from my understanding. All right. The conclusion was that if you looked on the balance, this this author, and I'm not making this claim, this author made the claim that it's really more about permanence. And um, there were a lot of things related to why that is the case, but it was a convincing argument when I read it. It's not to mean that there isn't okay. any strength and changes, but I think it's an important thing to think about, to, to realize, and this is where our our concept of synapse permanence comes from, came from. It came from that paper, which I cannot find, um, where, um, again, it was more like, hey, you know, we think this is just increasing the strength of it, but it really makes it harder to forget. And, yeah. and a, a synapse, which has a very small spine or no spine, like a philopedia, they call it, can almost it transmit as much neurotransmitter as a big one, but it goes away very quickly. Uh, that's like your fourth line there. So I just want to throw that in to make people understand that it's not just about strength. It's about, it's about how long will the synapse last in, in the life of the organism. Yeah, and uh, I can send you a paper that shows that the bigger the synapse, the more likely it is to be staying over time. So I have, I have a reference for that that I can send you. Uh, well, that's all right. I mean, I've already encapsulated this in my brain, so uh, <laughs> I just I just want to make sure other people understand that. But then uh, the, I, I would nuance that that uh, saying that if you have a bigger synapse, then it means you also have uh, more space for channels to insert at the membrane, and uh, the the more channel you have, the more depolarization at the level of the spine you're going to have. Yeah, that's that's the, yeah, that's right. But anyway, the argument can be made both, and yeah. it, it just it's not just about strength. Agreed.
Okay, I, last week I should have stopped here and, and done that slide because now we're gonna go one level higher, which is um, a level of the of the neuron itself and not the level of the of the spine. And so here, what I just want to mention is when you encode in a cell ensemble a specific memory, doesn't really matter what we're talking about here, but the random uh, uh, generic memory. Uh, there's some experiments that show that if you encode a first event in a subset of cells, and then you have a second event coming either six hours or 24 hours after, if you, uh, the second memory event is going to be encoded more likely in the same cells if it comes six hours after, and it's going to be uh, encoded in a different subset of cells if it's, come, if it's coming 24 hours after. So there is... Uh, um, where are these cells? Um, I can't remember if it's hypocampal or amygdala cells. I can't. Amy amygdala. Check. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Mm. I, I uh, I'm not sure this. I'm not sure this is true in cortex. So I'm not sure. Um, I, I'm gonna double check the experiment, the details of the experiments. I mean, and I can send it to you. Hippocampal cells, remember, encode also encode time and um, episodic time of events. And so um, part of what they do is record things in different points in time where it's not clear that that's happening at all in the cortex in terms of uh, like forming of memories. Um, so uh, I just, so it's, it may not be a general property. It may only be um, specific. Yeah. Specific. Uh, it, it might not be. Uh, I'm unsure if this has been shown somewhere else than uh, this specific structure. Things like this yeah. happen with place cells. I can say that. Uh, but the, uh, how so? Uh, for, there have been studies that um, if. Oh, well, it's hippocampus. Yeah. Yeah, hippocampus. Yeah, 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 I'm, yeah. Just, I'm just tying it. Sometimes we talk about place cells, so yeah. it's not totally foreign to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I agree with that. Yeah, um, the, the idea related to continual learning and, and some of the experiments we've done is, is it's not necessarily always useful to have a pattern of, of uh, memory storage that are completely different. And there might be something interesting here in uh, linking events that are related in time. Okay. Uh, if yeah, just ask question if you have one. Um, so, so for yeah, for that for that previous one, uh, do you think mm -hmm. it's kind of a continuous time type of thing where as more time elapses, it overlaps less, or is this yeah. more a, a product of like sleeping and having a big, big discrete change from sleeping? Um, that's actually a good question. I don't know if it took sleeping into account. Um, not sure. I see. Uh, but that's a good question. I should double check that. I think as this is in mice and mice tend to sleep on a less, um, like rigorous, um, schedule than, than we do. I don't know if it matters as much, but I, I it's a good point. I'll check. Okay, so um, now there's also a lot of mechanisms to maintain uh, homeostasis. And what that means is if you have at the level of the synapse or at the level of the neurons uh, in its entirety, you can have forever scaling up or down of, of connections, right? You have to have ways of regulating how big synapse can grow and how um, how little synapse you can have, right? And so there are some mechanisms to constrain um, uh, the, the, the whole, at the, at the level of the whole neuron, how to constrain and regulate uh, synapses at the whole, right? So you can have 
if you have, for example, uh, here two terminals and you have potentiation of one, then you have uh, a scaling of the one of the, the two, the one on the right and the one on the left, so that the overall activity can uh, remain the same, though, if the signal is going to come from the right, it's not going to have the same impact than coming from the left. OK, and now if we go, I'm not going to spend much time on this because we spent a lot of time on it and don't write. So but if we zoom out a bit more from the synapse, we also have a lot of linear and nonlinear integration that's going on to the level of the, the full neurons. And there's a spatial component that is usually not included in, in deep nets. Uh, so we have the temporal component that we already talked about. But there's also, also a spatial component that very often overlooked. And uh, uh, incoming signal from the same location on a dendritic branch won't have the same effect than the same uh, uh, magnitude of signal coming from all over the, uh, uh, the dendrites, right? OK, um, next, if so um, those memory ensemble that, that I briefly mentioned, those ensemble of cell that encode a specific memory, they're not fixed, right? They, they can be changed. They're very dynamic in time. So what that means is if you have a memory event uh, at T0, then either you have a very short memory, which is called short-term memory, and that uh, goes away very quickly, or you have long-term memory because you had the plasticity underlying those memory that allowed it to form and uh, be stored into long-term memory. And then when you want to recall something, you have a retrieval of that memory, and either you are going to completely forget about it because you're going to uh, rewrite that memory, or you have a consolidation event, so you, you consolidate the strength of that memory. Uh, another way of seeing that is on the right here, where the encoding can uh, of a specific pattern here we presented as the red uh, circles can be consolidated and then not necessarily being recalled for a long time. It becomes in a dormant state where the cells are not going to change necessarily very much. And um, then when you have a retrieval of that event, you can either uh, reconsolidate the same pattern of cell or if um, you have a, a retrieval of some events, but that event uh, is overwritten by another event, then that specific pattern is going to be modified. I'm confused. This diagram, it says the different colors are activity states. Are you interpreting like the firing rate of a neuron? What does that mean? Um, just if, yeah, if the neuron is going to be firing or not. Um, right, so, so over time here, this is, I don't, I don't know what the scale of time here is, because you're saying like on the left, you said, okay, they're, they're actively firing and they're fading away and fading away. That would typically be a very short period of time. Is that right? Uh, 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 sorry, which, where, where are you exactly? The first, the first three networks in a row across okay. the timeline, mm -hmm. you saw red, yep. less red, and yellowish. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if that's these firing rates of neurons, that's something that's going to happen very rapidly. It's going to, you know, they, they fire, then the next pattern comes in. So that could be happening on the order of, you know, 100 milliseconds or something like that. It, it, uh, not, yeah. I'm not yeah, sure I'm not, what this figure is showing. Um, I think it shows, uh, um, I mean, I might have not understood it properly, but uh, I'm not sure it exactly show the firing rate, but more of the, um, uh, activity in the sense of uh, plastic activity of that neurons in relation to the other ones, the other red ones, for example. So um, the encoding of a specific event is going to uh, happen, and you're going to have a lot of modification of that neurons, whether we're talking about activity. If you said, if you said those colors represented the sort of um, uh, the permanence of the synaptic connections, mm -hmm. then that would make sense to me. Then I could say, yeah, they could be fading over time. I'm forgetting this memory. Well, not necessarily, right? I, uh, some... if, if that's what it was, it would make sense to me. If you're saying it's the activity of the neurons, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, 
Yeah, I, I'm not sure, and I don't think that's going to be the activity as a as a firing rate. But then, what I is would, I, I think it would be more of uh, the the plasticity of the neuron in itself. So it it would and it would include the firing rate, but not only. Like spine dynamics would be included. Um, uh, protein modification would be included. All right, so that in, Okay, so they, again, that would be then related to synaptic state, not activity of yes. the neuron. Uh, so well, in the state, are linked, right? a state of the synapse can then have to even be receiving action potentials. It's just like, oh, what's the size of the spine or how many receptors it has? And so that to me would be like the fading of a memory, but you're saying it's not. I don't get it. And, and it's not even clear to me what's the timeline here. Is this happening very rapidly or is this over hours? Or no, no. I think that's pretty, that's not going to be rapid in time of so neuron, that really neuron time. Is, it's not the neuron activity state. These are states of syn individual synapses on that, on that neuron. And um, how else can I interpret that? I don't see how uh, else. I think the, the idea was more to have a schematic representation of, of the fact that the, the red network is not changing much. So the representation of that memory, which is, in, encoded into uh, interaction of neurons is not changing that much over time. I think that's what well, the idea that of the is. That would mean that the synaptic connectivity between those neurons is not changing much over time. Uh, not on the specific synapses. Yeah, not on the specific synapses that encode that memory. Not on the specific synapses? It would have to yeah. be on the specific synapses. How could yes. it not be? Yes. No, it is. Oh, but okay. the, yeah. it, the, All right. So this is, again, th then this represents not a neuron activity state. It represents a synaptic, a, a subset of the population of synapses on these neurons. Yeah. What is their metabolic state at this point in time? Yes. No. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's a good analysis. That's a good phrasing. Okay, it, yep. it was labeled neuron activity state, which seems very misleading. Uh, okay. I see, the, I see the difference in what you mean now. Okay. Um, no, I think the first way you framed it was good, and it, I don't think it means that those neurons are not active, they are, it's just the subset of synapses that encode, or the subset of connection that encode that memory is uh, uh, not changing much. Yeah, well, the, those, those neurons will be fine for different patterns at different times, yes. But, yes. but this particular pattern is not going to be yes. occurring this time. Yep, yep, agreed. Okay. Okay, so if you have another question, um, I'm going to change to the next, which basically uh, is the same idea that those memory ensemble are dynamic and that they evolve over time with a specific example of some uh, memory encoded in a specific brain region. In that case, it's going to be the hippocampus, but uh, in itself, it does not matter. But these specific memory ensemble can be transferred or written out of this brain region they were encoded and to another brain region that is going to be its final storage location. This is the idea that uh, these fast form memories in the hippocampus are transferred to cortex. Yeah, that's the idea, yeah. Yeah. For, I there, mean, was a, there was a paper that we read a while back this, this idea of this transferring, I mentioned this yet last week, um, always struck me as odd. And, and there was a paper that was, uh, we, we reviewed here at Nementa some number of years ago, which forcefully made the point that memories are not transferred from the hippocampus to the cortex, but that they are uh, independently formed at different rates. And yet somehow if you remove the hippocampus, the ones in the cortex uh, do not form. But it, I forget the details of the paper, but they, it was pretty, it was pretty uh, persuasive that it, it just to, the idea that they're being transferred is not, may not be right. It's more like they're, they're occurring simultaneously in both places, but at very different time scales. Um, uh, I just want to make a point of that. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the conventional view. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I did not. I, I tried not to. I think, I realize it's maybe a little bit more too much detail already. So, yeah, yeah. Um, the the main idea was main to 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 make the point that memories 
are dynamic and don't stay in the same state all the time and viewing um, in the context, for example, of continual learning, viewing uh, the single purpose of remembering everything in the same way might not be the best way to look at things. A quick question. Uh, what's the mechanism for the recall queue uh, basically uh, finding another route to the new location for the memory? Um, I don't have that in mind right now. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I can I can look it up. Um, in that specific example, I, I can't remember how. It, I'm not sure it's specified. I, I just wonder if it was broadcast and it's simply ignored because there wasn't something that would acknowledge it or whether it really forged another signal or not, another pathway or not. Uh, I think it's going to be rerouted differently, but I might be wrong. So, okay. Yeah, you can you can slack me the question. And I'll try to to dig it up. Okay, and so uh, another point I just briefly wanted to mention is that those networks in some specific region, well, that's still debatable, but. Uh, there might be some neurons that are generated sometimes all the time um, in some specific brain region, which would allow uh, cell to acquire the ability to encode a highly uh, um, or high information on some specific inputs. So for example, here, those two uh, inputs are not really well represented by any of the neurons that are encode that series of input. And if you add new neurons, you can uh, specifically tune those neurons to encode those specific uh, input signals. And for example, uh, at least in mice, these uh, neurons have been shown to, in to uh, help with discriminating uh, very close uh, stimuli. You know, there, I have a question about this. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, for many, many years, people didn't think any new neurons were created. And mm -hmm. then they started finding examples of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I know in the hippocampal formation, they found examples of this um, and some other older parts of the brain. What's the general consensus about neurogenesis in the cortex? I, I, I'm not familiar with the current literature on that. Do you know anything about that? Uh, I don't think it's been really shown in the cortex. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's definitely a consensus for, for mice and uh, in the olfactory bulb and hippocampus. There's less of a consensus for human uh, olfactory bulb and even uh, hippocampal neurogenesis as well. Uh, the actual, uh, the, the hypothesis is that it occurs a lot at early ages, but then by adolescence, it's almost gone. Yeah. Um, but uh, because- one could, argue, one could argue that, you know, obviously when you have new neurons, you're, you're, you're gonna be losing neurons too. And um, and one can argue that this is a way of this helps you learn, like you just showed in this figure, but it also forces you to forget things. Yep. And um, and so again, in the hippocampus, that's okay. Um, these episodic memories, we're forgetting them all the time. We're forming new ones all the time. That's fine. What happened to me, you know, six years ago, it may not be so relevant. Um, yep. But in the cortex, we are basically just learning the structure of the world, more permanent structure of the world, then it wouldn't make as much sense. It, it would make it easier to learn new things, but you'd also be forgetting fundamental things you knew. So um, it kind of makes sense that you wouldn't see this much in the cortex, um, but you would see it in the hippocampus. Yeah, it's, it seems to be a, a mechanism to adapt uh, to environment or to stimuli that you can't 
predict in the sense that, for example, you can uh, with with uh, um, vision you have a specific uh, light spectrum that you can see, but with uh, context or, or others there is such a, a broad uh, uh, input space that you cannot predict everything that's going to be uh, uh, an input. And so you have adaptive mechanisms to be able to uh, uh, adapt according to the environment you, you are in. I mean, in some okay. sense, this yep. this property doesn't. You could do this without neurogenesis. You know, just having new neurons recruited into an existing memory and become part of an existing memory. Uh, it's just neurons that were not used before could become part of this memory without explicit neurogenesis. No, or or you could take an existing neuron and sort of wipe out its synapses and repurpose it, right? So yeah, this, yeah. So this that. This may be just nature's way of like, you know, cleaning out cruft and um, starting fresh. Yeah, or even without wiping out the existing stuff, um, you know, because these representations are distributed, you can just have a few more neurons involved in a particular yeah. representation um, and it that will work fine. In fact, in some sense, the spatial pooler would do this. You know, if you, well, we, there we have fixed sparsity, but if you start seeing new patterns more frequently, you, you the representation shift a little bit and yeah. new neurons become part of it. Yeah. Yeah, and the little difference I would say that if you wipe out neurons, you have a risk of removing an essential neuron from another uh, memory or another input. Right? Well, in some sense, but you remember there's never, well, in any kind of distributed representation, um, there's never an essential neuron. There's, you know, at some point you wipe out enough and then the thing collapses, but you know, it slowly degrades. Yep. Anyway, it, this is an interesting property. Superdice says it's not clear you have to do this. It only occurs in parts of the brain. There are other ways you can achieve it. This may be just one of those biological things that helps brains adapt quickly. Well, it's not very quick, but... Well, yeah, it's... This point, like, adapt in a way like quickly, as in uh, over the course of you know days and months, like you know, yeah. type of thing. Yeah, it's true that it might not be necessary in a in a constructed and uh, um, right. Yeah. Um, model. Yep. Yeah. So, so I, I want to mm -hmm. uh, challenge to tie on one thing he said. So you're saying that there's there's never a need to create a new axon to, you know, forge unique connections where none existed before. I mean, as long as there's an, a, enough connectivity, oh, no, no. New you connections. reprogram the dendrites. No, new connections happen all the time. Uh, right, but I mean, if, if, if there's a portion of the brain that wasn't, you know, highly connected before, and for some reason, because of, you know, you lose a sense and it wants to readapt, uh, if it seems like it would be limiting if it only could use existing axon infrastructure to maybe you know try to approximate what it's now getting as a stimulated input as opposed to uh, finding the need to actually generate a new axon to or you know actually, directly represent actually, what it is. Um, uh, Kevin, it I don't think that's right. Here's, here's the way to think about it. If you think, if you look at an axon and it's got all these branches, right? They stick out, they're going all over the place. But they don't go, they don't go all over the place. They go a lot of places, but they don't go all over the place. But the ends of the axons are actually growing all the time. They grow out and they recede, and they grow out and they recede. They're like little like fingers trying to figure out if there's something out there they can connect to with, with um, some value. If they don't find anything to connect to, they recede. So even existing neurons. The dendrites and the axon tips are growing and receding and growing and receding, trying to find useful connections. Creating a new neuron doesn't really help it help you any further. You still have to send your axon someplace and, and figure out where it goes. So um, it's from a theory point of view, it really wouldn't matter 
Um, you're trying to form connections to places you haven't had before, whether you grow the existing neurons or you put a new neuron in, it's kind of the same thing. Um, I mean, how would the, where would the new neuron know where to go? It doesn't, it doesn't know where to send its axon. There's no like, oh, I need to send it to this other section over here. There's no way of knowing that. So it's based, you saw when you're born, you have these very profuse connections. The ones aren't used or cut back. And then, then, then it continually probes trying to find useful ones again. So, so that's the, the, not... degree, the degree that with that that's it, the axons continue to grow and uh, uh, find new worm their way in different directions uh, in adulthood. Uh, that's not highly restricted, or is that? Well, it can only grow a little bit from the tip, right? It can't just go willy nilly anywhere. Sure. But, yeah, but... there's still some 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 molecular cue that are gonna guide growth of axons. So you you're gonna have cues. In the environment that are going to say don't go there or go there that that's, still... pre that's that's pretty the local effect right i mean that's there's no there's no there's no clue that says you need to go you know uh three centimeters over here oh there um, is a development yeah sure. during development yeah but not during an adult brain right so um, during, de during development you've got this it, it tells you where to basically send send your axons and dendrites most of your axons and um and then actually you start experiencing the world, some of those things are useful and some of them aren't. And the ones that don't seem to be useful get pruned back. Um, but yes, that, agreed. But, but that doesn't but, seem, but I don't think that's happening again during adulthood. You know, if I look at the cortex, you're not seeing a whole bunch of new cells forming that are being told where to send their axon. That doesn't exist. I don't have an example uh, to contradict that, so. I think, I think one point is, it's worth maybe you mentioning is the glial cells and other cells in the cortex that are in the brain that are not neurons, they play a role in helping steer axons and dendrites together. So if an axon and a dendrite yes. are too far apart to form a synapse, but not very far apart, like, you know, they're, they're nearby, they're like on, you know, they're just close, but they don't see each other. Then a, then a glial cell can say, you know, you two ought to get together and I'll help you figure that out. Um, yep. But yeah, I didn't firm, go into that. That's one, of the, that's one of the roles of the astrocytes, right? Uh, well, glial Different cell. type of glial cell are going to play different types of role in regulating yeah. uh, interaction. So glial cell are going to play a role, but microglia are going to play a role. So for example, they can remove spines uh, on specific neurons. Um, okay. And we, I, I didn't go into that uh, here, but instead of speaking of, of a, a spine that is a pre and a past synaptic element, we're starting to speak more about a tripartite spine where you have an, a glial element associated with that usually. And the glial element is also able to regulate uh, uh, the, the synaptic strength. Yeah, so you can think of these cells as like little matchmakers. They help the two, the axon and the dendrite get along. Um, but they don't have a very long effect distance-wise. Uh, that's not true anymore, I think, because, for example, uh, uh, there's, it's been shown that glial cell can have calcium waves, and those calcium waves can go pretty far. And actually, two neurons that ha are, have, are not connected can be, uh, and very, well, relatively distant, can be uh, activated via glial cells that propagate. How, how, uh, how, what do you mean relatively distance? What kind of distances you're talking about? Um, I, I, I'm not a specialist of that at all. So I know it occurs. I don't think it's going to be like from frontal to parietal cortex, but it can still be a, maybe a couple of millimeters. I don't, I'm not sure. I, 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 I need to check I, that. I'd like to see that because my, my impression is it's fairly short. I mean, yeah, maybe maximum of a couple of millimeters. Um, I, I'll check the exact yeah. uh, data you know, on that. But, but it's still a sure. local thing. It's not like some action says, I need to get over and talk to the, the auditory system. You know, uh, it's, it's all local. It's a local field. But for, 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 for glial cells, uh, probably yes. Uh, for, for guidance cues, uh, I'm not sure about adulthood. I don't have an example that would contradict what you're saying, but at least in development, uh, for sure, Guidance cues for uh, synapses or for for axon growth can can extend very far. But outside of development, yeah, 
I'd like to see that. I haven't, okay. I haven't seen that. That'd be useful. So well. There's a, a bunch of, well, a bunch of, a, a lot of guidance cues that have gradient and that are going to say, don't go there, go there. And that will be, that will allow specific clusters of, of neurons to connect on the right target. Yeah, but just imagine, imagine this. What you're ultimately generally trying to do is to find, connect an axon to a dendrite that have a, um, a coincidence in firing or that are, you know, that they can productively form a synapse, which is really like, like, like heavy and type of learning. There is no yes. other clue as far as, you know, outside of development where you can say, generally, this is a good place to go. Um, there's no other clue to guide this. And so the idea that you you'd have to figure out some way of, of saying, you know, way over there, there's a, there's a, a, a you're a dendrite or you're an axon, there's a way in the distance, there's somebody who's, who might be useful to you form a synapse to, it's hard to imagine what kind of, you know, gradient that would be someone who could detect that over long distances. We're talking about specific axons and specific dendrites. It's not a particular, it's not like a general thing. Um, uh, yeah, once again, I think in development, it is, it is there uh, in yeah. adulthood and especially in the cortex, I'm, I don't have an example of. Yeah, I'm, I, I'd be surprised, but if it was, I'd like to know it. Um, I can try to see if I can find but one. Only if you think it exists. I mean, if you're pretty confident. I, I haven't seen it in, in adulthood. Oh, I don't have an example in mind of seeing that to be true yeah. in adulthood uh, in cortex. Yeah, me too. But also I'm thinking like just logically walking through what it would mean and why it would happen. It seems very, very hard to imagine that could happen. Um, in our simulations, we can make anything happen. We can say this neuron, these two, these two neurons should form a synapse. And therefore, we don't really care how far apart they are. Um, uh, but but in cortical in neural tissue, it's very hard to imagine a mechanism that would be that specific directed over long distances. Um, so I, I doubt it, but I could be wrong. Yep. Other questions? Okay. So let's take a, a step out again uh, and talk about a bit more behavior and context and different type of behavior. And here, this example is to illustrate that uh, if you do a training, which is called spaced, where you have a, a, an event occurring on different days versus a, a training that's called masked, which is basically having the same type of training, but occurring on Every, every five of them occurring on the same day, you are going to have different type of memory encoded in the sense that the memory length is going to be different. And so um, the idea uh, is just- Excuse me, memory length being the, the permanence of the memory? Yes, um, uh, it's going to be the behavioral expression of the memory. Memory length means what? How long you remember it? That the word uh, How long the animal is going to be behaving in a specific way. Okay, so the length of the memory, got it. Uh, at the behavioral level, yes. Yeah. Well, um, what else is there? I'm saying that because, because you don't see a behavior at the behavioral level doesn't, doesn't mean there's not remnants of that behavior encoded at the cellular level. And for example, if I'm uh, doing the second uh, training on the right, the animal is going to forget, but then if I'm retraining him, he's going to be able to relearn that training much quicker than the first time. Meaning there's still something at the cellular level that is there and that allows for that training to happen much faster. The point here was that depending on the type of behavior change or, or memory type, the underlying uh, cellular events are going to be different. And that is also the case when you have different contexts, right? So if um, we take stress, for example, as a, um, an example, you can have very low or very high level of stress which are um, usually represented as 
that kind of shape where too low stress is not good and too high stress is not good, but the, you have an optimal stress level which allow for optimal performances. And what that means is you can devise some experiment that show when you have a high level of stress, you have a better or a, a, a worse memory. And when you can optimize for being at the highest peak of that curve, you can have the best memory. And there's some data shown that basically some stresses uh, on the left here are going to interact via some proteins, some specific cascade of protein with the same uh, um, molecule that are involved in learning and memory storage at the cellular level. So the, the context in that sense matters for forming and for getting memories. And that's also the case for neuromodulatory system, which are uh, basically broad um, diffuse system in the brain. So you have cholinergic, noradrenergic, serotoninergic, and dopaminergic. The specific name don't really matter, but what you need to take away from that is those systems are, uh, depending on the context and the environment, going to be more or less activated. And besides uh, those uh, plasticity events that we talked about previously, those additional events can regulate and modify the plasticity events that we talked about. So if I take this key schema on the right here, um, the same stimulation of the neuron, depending on the modulator that is released at the same time, is not going to have the same effect on the cell. And so a plasticity event or, or uh, um, a stimulation that results in some type of plasticity event can be modified by those mod neuromodulators and results in a, a modulation that's going to be different for the same stimulation, but in different contexts. So, so Jeremy here, hmm? uh, I don't know if you are going to go into this in more detail, but probably the not. Dopa but... Yeah, the dopamine inter dopaminergic one is the one that's mm -hmm. associated with rewards and most closely tied to reinforcement learning and machine learning. Yeah. That's, so that's the idea. Uh, uh, in terms of kind of drawing a parallel to AI stuff and mm -hmm. machine learning stuff. It, do you have a sense for the other three? What, if there's any machine learning analogs uh, like that? Uh, not as closely related, I think, uh, or at least not that I'm aware of. Because historically, uh, I think dopamine in our sense has been uh, linked with reward prediction error. And that yeah. talked a lot with the ML crowd that directly saw a relevance of it. I don't think there's been a, a specific cross link uh, uh, that's been made for the other systems. OK. You know, I forget, um, there are behavioral correlates associated with these other systems or, or emotional state correlates. And I don't remember what they are. It's not like they're totally unknown. No, 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 um, of course not. I'm, I'm just saying I don't I, I, yeah, know. Yeah, of, I, I, yeah I, I don't know if they've been modeled in the AI world at all. Yeah, I, I know. I'm, I'm mentioning this because... Um, you know, one of the questions I've gotten when we talk about modeling cortex, people ask me about these neuromodulatory systems, and I've always said, well, they're, they're clearly not um, the way we remember it. They're not part of the circuits for remembering the model of the world and so on. They're, they're modulatory, right? And so some of them might be associated with, you know, fear, or some of them might be associated with, you know, with uh, uh, sex or romance or things like that. And um, I just point out that, if, from my perspective, you can always you can you can remove these systems from the cortex's information processing role and just say, well, we have switches. We can speed up memory. We can slow down the formation of memory. We can. There's various sort of system level controls, and you don't have to emulate these systems directly. That's been my argument, at least. Um, uh, and some of them might not have any role at all in terms of. Um, 
building a, a, a system that models a world where clearly the dopaminergic system is one that involves rewards and therefore it, you can argue, well, it, that's a good learning rule. But even that could be replaced with a, you know, a switch to saying we want to learn now and not learn now type of thing. How, how far I'm are these four? I'm just putting some flavor on this. I'm sorry, Kevin. How, how far are these four systems, uh, uh, how, how are they preserved down through the animal kingdom? I mean, are these, is this something uh, of, of just arbitrarily, is this something the mammalian brain has all four of these things or it goes down to reptilian or does anyone know um, uh, whether uh, these these systems, uh, all four systems, are conserved down to some level in the in the uh, uh, in the genetic tree. Um, I'm not sure of the exact uh, animal that you could say that's that's where it emerged, um, but they are pretty. Uh, ancient or, or old system and and, and um, yeah the gist is they would be pretty conserved along evolution yeah you can see yeah, that, I've seen the, everything the from, source, the, from the r brains so yeah yeah but kevin you can look here the source of these the cells that actually distribute these neuromodulators are all like in the brain stem and the basal ganglia you can see that mm -hmm. in these pictures right so they're these, and they're also spreading to parts of the old brain. They're going to the cerebellum and various, you know, the, the, the amygdala. I don't know where they're going down there. So it's clearly something that's been around for a long time, and it's just been extended to the cortex. Well, that would be your first guess, right? As, as Jeremy said, you know, it's, it's, these are pretty ancient-looking things. They're, they're buried in the old parts of the brain, so they're probably been there for a long, long time. And other animals, non-mammals, probably have equivalent ones. I mean, it could I mean, it could go all the way down to you know vertebrate structure. I mean, uh, I, I was just kind of curious if anyone I, I don't know had but, on that. You know, I'm sure you could read the literature on it and find out what animals have these things and which don't. Yeah, there's definitely analogs uh, uh, for invertebrate. Invertebrate as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you, you can go pretty far. Okay. And and the the principle of of neuromodulation is is very old. Um, I I just wanted to relate this kind of um, context dependent modulation with the dendrite work we recently did and how um, maybe there is something to dig here about how context or different contexts can modulate the same input on, on the same neuron. We talked a little bit about that already, but I think it was, uh, and it's an interesting point to, to think about. And I think, yeah, maybe Ben yeah. mentioned that at one point. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I'm almost done. I just wanted to, mentioned this briefly, uh, which is that those mechanisms that we talked about are not set in stone along the lifetime of an animal or an organism. And for example, when you uh, go from development to postnatal development, uh, the GABA, you have a GABA switch where GABA comes, uh, being excitatory in the embryonic development becomes inhibitory in postnatal development. And those, um, those needs to be taken into account if you want to develop a system that analogous to the brain has some phase of development and some phase of maturation. Is this in embryo specifically or is it? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure you'd have to emulate that at all. I mean, th that basically says while well, we're building a brain without any sensory input, um, it works one way, but once you're out of the womb and you're now modeling the world, it works another way. I'm not sure you would ever really, unless you wanted to grow your model in an embryo, I don't, I'm not sure why you would think you'd want to emulate that. It seems like that we could just eliminate that. So, you know, we're not, we're not really interested in how brains know how to grow in the, in the womb, uh, but assuming they have this structure at birth, how do they learn? 
So I guess I'd push back on that idea that we might want to do both. It seems to me, I, this would be a very easy one for me to say, yeah, you don't have to do the left side. Here. Okay, I, I don't think I agree on that in the sense that you might want to have some um, some pre-wiring happening yeah. and that might be a way to do it. Yeah, right, but, but why pre-wire it the way, you know, other, other you have to create a growing brain in a womb, I mean, it's or something equivalent to it. You could just start with, you know, at birth and say, here's the kind of pre-wiring we have and, and let's go from there. Um, it, it's, I see no purpose at all in, in sort of emulating or modeling or simulating or anything. In well, if it's not fully deterministic, then then you might miss something, right? What? It, I, I, I'll just let's leave it at that. I, I, I okay. disagree. You know, I, you know, the point is not how the brain, you know, look, we don't have to figure it, we don't have to grow neurons from the neural plate and have them go up in the little mini columns and then grow. I mean, we don't have to do any of that stuff. That's like, forget it. It's you come out alone, you got a brain, it's got some wiring. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, no, I, I don't say we have to do everything. I'm just saying there might be some mechanisms that are interesting to explore because they have a relevance. All right. I guess I would say this would be an easy one to say, put that at the bottom of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Let's leave it at that for now. Uh, and the, the right is, is the same idea with aging in the sense that when you age, you have uh, a balance of proteins that is modified, which can result in deficits or, or uh, plasticity that is changing over time. I'm not saying we have to emulate that. I'm just saying it can. Uh, it is interesting to understand what's happening under the hood sometimes. I, I mean, a fundamental question is, you know, if you have a, a lifelong learning brain, does it require uh, decay? You know, I don't think so. I certainly wouldn't want to believe so. Um, I hope not. You know, uh, what I'm saying is those study can help figure out what's required and what's not when the system goes. Yeah, all right, I put this, I put this second at the bottom to the list. Okay. <laughs> that was my side point on the end of, of that presentation. And I just wanted to conclude on the fact that the brain has a lot of time, time scales that interact. And I think that might be one of the missing thing in, in artificial neural networks. Yeah, yeah. The, the, this stuff is definitely not uh, taken into account. I would say the only thing that comes close is the reinforcement learning. Things where uh, you do control, where you d have a sense of kind of how fast things should learn depending on how far away it is from reward. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a temporal difference or time, time component there, but nothing like the flexibility of the stuff that you talked about. Mm -hmm. Another, yeah, I mean, you talk a, uh, quite a bit about homeostasis as well in different places, and that's in, in machine learning, there's a lot of batch normalization and yep. homeostasis at the level of activity. But in terms of weights, uh, some people have done work on weight normalization, but uh, you know, I don't think that's been a big, uh, I don't know if that's, uh, I don't think that's standard in, in, in networks either. So that's another possible uh, thing people can incorporate. Yeah, and I didn't enter like the role of sleep in, in weight decay and regularization in the brain or things like that. There's yeah, definitely yeah. some things to explore there too. Yeah.